Hello, my name is Trish Lynch from IOHR in London. Thank you for being with us for another episode of our Human Rights TV. With us today is Hanif Kadir, a former Islamist extremist who joined Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. Deterred by the crimes he saw being committed against civilians, he came back to the UK to launch the Active Change Foundation, which is dedicated to helping young people in danger of becoming radicalised. Today, Hanif is actively involved in advising and assisting senior policymakers in reforming key aspects of the preventing violent extremism and also counter-violent extremism. He also works closely with a wide range of government institutions, the police, authorities, as well as research academics across the globe. Mr. Gadir, thank you for joining us today. It's great to have you with us. It's a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Now, do you think that your previous experience as an extremist has helped you to understand and get into the heads of young people that might be going down the wrong path? Absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt. I mean, without that experience, one could never understand what are the, the, uh, the drivers, what are the triggers, what are the emotional aspects to um, you know, getting involved. But also, traveling the journey gives you a unique understanding of how these people operate, how they think, how they mobilize, and how they manipulate. So absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt, that experience has given me uh, an advantage and it's provided with a lot of success over the years. You went over there because you thought you were going to go over and do some good, but what you saw made you come back. Tell me what your experiences were like. What made you turn your back on it? Just like every other individual that's gone to Syria or Iraq or Afghanistan, they, they all think that they're going to go over there to do some good. Mm -hmm. um, my experience is like many of the young men that have gone today to Syria to join ISIS or to join Al-Qaeda is that you get to realize how, you know, very rapidly, how unorthodox and how barbaric these regimes actually are. You don't see that from afar. You have a different perception and different outlook and different understanding of what their role is or what the West is doing. Uh, you see it as a, a war on Islam or a war on Muslims, but when you get there, you actually find that these groups are part of that war on Islam and the war on Muslims because they don't represent Islam. And you see that firsthand when you're at the grass, when, you, when you're on the ground. I saw members from Al-Qaeda abusing young kids, grooming them f to become suicide bombers. Now, what part of Islam is that? And what part is protecting the communities is that? So that's what I was exposed to, and that's what I think a lot of individuals that are traveling uh, nowadays do get exposed to, but unfortunately for some, it's, t it's a bit too late. You were recruited by a terrorist network in 2002. Tell me how you were recruited, what methods did they use to recruit you, and why do you think you were vulnerable? Why were you a target? Um, I think it's, it's not um, about how I was recruited. Uh, well, it is really, but the process of, of being recruited at that point are very easy. You are kind of gravitating towards somebody or something that will give you uh, an understanding as to what's going on. Um, you become very emotional when you see the loss of, of life of innocent women and children. And that's what's happening, that's been ha happening over, you know, decades with regards to Israel and Palestine and Iraq and, you know, Afghanistan and all, all the other conflict zones. People like me w were drawn to the humanitarian issues, the emotional side of things when you see hundreds and thousands of young women and children being, you know, being brutally, you know, savaged and de destroyed their, their homes destroyed by the regimes or by the, uh, the invading forces, you want to find out what you can do to stop that. What's your role as a human being, first and foremost? And secondly, what is your role as a Muslim? Um, and you're looking, you're searching for these answers, and those answers are very readily available, you know, like we can see today online and offline. There are many people within our societies, not just here in the UK, but all around the world, that will offer people like me or young individuals uh, or other individuals um, a solution or an answer to what they're experiencing at home, watching the TV screens, watching social media, watching the images of the innocent women, women and children being, being brutalized. So it's kind of self-recruiting kind of in a way, but there are you know, influencing sources and manipulating individuals out there with information that will even further draw you in, you know, because you become like a magnet, you know, you become drawn to them like a magnet because you start to realize very rapidly that this war on terror um, and if you, can, if you can engage with individuals in different parts of the world, from the Muslim community especially, they will tell you that this war on terror is perceived as a war on Islam because of the amount of innocent women and children that are being killed. The war on terror has actually hasn't decreased the, the terrorist issue. It's actually increased it hundredfold. And the main people that are suffering as a result are Muslims. So 
you know, it's, it's very easy for individuals to be drawn and to gravitate towards that information and to that kind of, you know, perception that they can do something. Social media is a real game changer. You were recruited in 2002 when social media wasn't that active, but now a post, a photograph, a video of a beheading can be seen in seconds by millions of people all around the world. Tell me how you use social media to prevent young people from going down the same route that you unfortunately went down. So it's, look, w what we found very, very useful, and this is one thing that I've been trying to get across to different governments and different institutions is that, if we look at the, the ideology of the extremists and the, the methods that they use, they're very successful. Mm -hmm. You know, why are we here talking? Why, are, why is everybody talking about terrorism and, 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 uh, you know, and conflict? Why don't we use their methods? So we know that they've used social media. They will use every single method or everything, everything that's going to allow them to project or you know, echo their voice a lot more. Now, we know they had foot soldiers. We had people in the communities that were engaging with communities. And now they've used the social media platforms to their advantage. Uh, but who are they using to amplify those voices? They're using young people. They're using the human resource that we have access to. The problem is, is that we are not meeting them with the same human resource. We're not approaching this uh, through the same lens as they're approaching it. You know, the narrative that they have is a very strong and powerful narrative. The narrative that we've got to come and create has to be equally as strong and powerful, but in a much more positive way, by using the same human resource that these people uh, are using as well. So what we've decided to do, what we've been doing over the last few years, I mean, one of the campaigns we launched was the Not In My Name campaign, which you know, was projected by young people and it amplified their voices to over 300 million people around the world. It actually did cause ISIS a bit of an issue. So it's campaigns like that, it's getting young people to stand up and, and take this battle forward. It's not people like me. We've got to lead from behind. It's governments have got to step back and allow the people, the young people in particular, the target audience, not to be part of a problem, but to show and actually uh, give them the platform to be part of the solution. So if we look at the way ISIS, Al-Qaeda and those operate, they empower the, the young people, the foot soldiers, mm -hmm. to be part of their solution. In your TED videos, you talk about how the conversation needs to change. That is, these young people are surrounded and immersed in this negative conversation all the time, that nothing is going to change, and that it's your job to make that a positive conversation. How do you go about doing that? I think it's everybody's job, really. If we look at how revolutions have been initiated through ideas and conversations, we can start to have a conversation here, and that will shape the way we both think, but also we can then shape the way the rest of the people think. It's how we empower those conversations, how we facilitate those conversations in, a, in, a, in our communities. By isolating a, a certain community uh, or you know, and not allowing them a platform to have those conversations in a very positive way, we're only going to uh, support the narrative on the ideology of the extremists from all sides. It's, a, it's about giving young people the chance, you know, giving them the opportunity to sort of shape those conversations at a grassroots level which will then flourish, you know, uh, you know across, the, across, the, across the country and across the world. Because it's the conversations that will create the problem and have been creating the problem. And I, I firmly believe that by facilitating the dialogue between young people and, and government, but also facilitating the dialogue between young people and adults, it's very, very important. It's bringing all people together uh, to have positive conversations. To, Let's talk about the conflicts in Iraq and Syria and Afghanistan. Let's talk about them, you know, and, and Palestine. By um, refusing to allow an individual to express their concerns or their views around, with regards to conflict around the world, we are, you know, inadvertently creating a pressure cooker kind of scenario. And it's only the way forward, the only way forward is to allow that debate to happen so those conversations can be shaped positively, uh, which will also determine how those conversations will be held on social media. Because we know social media is absolute powerful. It's like a nuclear weapon if you use it effectively. Yeah. But it has to be, you know, uh, you can only use that effectively if you're giving the young people the empowerment and the, and the opportunity to express themselves positively. You're also a major contributor in the UK government prevent policy. Tell me what are the strengths and weaknesses of that policy and what do you think needs to be done to make it even more effective? So I, I was advisor to, to the government for many, many years. I'm not now. Um, it's been a difficult, uh, let's say, 10, 12 years trying to get 
civil servants, uh, thinkers, uh, and, and politicians to actually understand the depth of this problem um, and what are the, the, you know, the solutions to this. Uh, everybody has their own ideas. We've got you know, Cambridge and Oxford graduates coming out and sort of coming up with policy without actually having any real understanding of the dynamics within society. So my job has always been to sort of look ahead. It's always been like a, a forward thinking kind of plan. And you can only do that when you understand the narrative mm -hmm. that these terrorist groups are espousing. So the vision, uh, what I've been, uh, been uh, exposed to over the years, uh, with that understanding of their vision and their narrative, you can sometimes plan, a, plan ahead and figure out what's coming next. So when we had the, the Syrian uh, conflict brewing, it was just, a, uh, it was just a, like, a, like a kind of revolution. There was no real war. I was tasked to advise the government as to what's going next. I mean, they would call me and say, what do you think is happening next? And I expressed to them that if we have some form of violence erupting in Syria, this will then turn out to be like this, and then we'll have the black banners, and then we'll have the different groups. And everybody thought I was crazy. But, you know, fast forward to three, four years later, and we've got the black banners, we've got the different groups, we've got the biggest problem, perhaps, of our age, you know, uh, brewing up. And government sometimes find that very difficult to understand and to digest. You've said in your book that we need a national and an international unified approach, everybody singing from the same hymn sheet. Do we have that at the moment? And no. if not, what needs to be we done? We are far from that, and that's the problem. Um, we, we do not have enough investment within our young people. The investment that we're getting from, from governments, not just in this country but from around the world, is tokenistic. And I say that uh, quite clearly without even flinching because it's a fact. If you go at the grassroots level, we've got a number of issues within our communities with regard to gang crime and gun crime. We've got youth organisations closing down on a daily basis. We've got no real understanding of how to engage with our communities, how to sort of move them and shape them forward in a positive way. So the problem that we have got coming our way is actually bigger than we've had over the years. The reason being is that the lack of government reality about the problem, but also the risk adverseness that's coming from not just this government, but many European governments and Central Asian governments around the world, because they don't want to really... Let me rephrase that. I won't say they don't want to. I'll say that they are not really trying to engage and, and take the bull by the horns. It's a bit tokenistic, and I've seen that time and time again uh, over, the, over the last four or five years working with different governments. Beside the work that you do on preventing violent extremism, you also work on countering violent extremism. In the newspapers, it's a global issue that we hear time and time again about exactly what should happen to returning soldiers. What do you think should happen to them? So over the many years, you know, you're right, a lot of my work has been about preventing uh, the issue from you know, developing to extremist behaviour. But my, my main work and what I have a, a strong passion for is countering it. And that's been as an intervention provider to those that have become radical or become terrorists. And, I, and when we started to see the, um, the development of in individual potentially returning, I put it out to government at the time that I would offer my services pro bono free of charge to assess, to pro provide an assessment. I found that to be an opportunity that we shouldn't miss and I don't think any country should miss that opportunity. And I'm, I'm a firm believer that give change a chance. Um, I have not come across an individual that I haven't been able to um, convince or to mentor to move away from violence. Um, so I think that it's very important that governments, uh, our government here in the UK, but other governments as well, look at this as a, as a huge opportunity to, um, to grasp, but also to engage with those individuals that are returning. Obviously, with the, with the security measures in place, um, with the control measures in place, this is very, very important because we don't know the capacity of the individuals that are coming back. But one thing I know, and one thing is for certain, they have a wealth of experience. They have a wealth of knowledge and a wealth of understanding. Um, they may be traumatized, but also we can use that knowledge, that experience to prevent thousands of other young people from even traveling or even thinking about that path. It's like a, a multiplication of people like me, and there are others that have done and, and went on, on a journey and have come back, but I think it's an absolute, um, it's, it's, an, it's essential that governments engage with returnees, uh, one, to give them a chance to change, but number two, 
to prevent others within their societies in their countries from even traveling on the same pa on, the, on the same path in the first place let me ask you what happened to you because you went in 2002 and you returned in 2003 did you pick up the pieces of your life was was there any fallout was there any action taken against you when you returned so there was no action taken against me because um, uh, obviously I, you know, social media wasn't something that we were very you know, used to using at that time. But also being careful about using our, our mobile phones and who, how we were communicating. We were very clever at that time. So I wasn't, you know, no, nobody took any action against me. I kept that to myself. I picked up my pieces. I literally, my life was turned upside down. But I picked up the pieces over the years. Um, and the first person that I ever uh, expressed this to was a, was a police officer. Uh, who became a friend, uh, who actually took time to engage with all of our young people. So it was him that I, 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 I exposed you know, what had happened to me. And he is the one, I mean, it's a guy called Ian Lander, um, an absolute amazing individual, but he's the one that then was a bit gobsmacked, but also found that he could use me as an asset, potentially, to one, advise uh, police up another country, but also governments and other NGOs in their attempts to uh, engage with young people. This was in 2003, 2004. So I was on a, like a, a national sort of tour of the UK, you know, speaking at different conferences about my experiences. And that's where my work started to really unravel. Um, but with the help of Ian and, and with my experience over the years, we've managed to change you know, hundreds of people. We've managed to save a lot of lives. Is there a certain demographic, is there a certain age group, a certain background that would be more susceptible to being radicalised? Because you were a businessman with a family. Are you a typical candidate? Everybody is a candidate. Everybody? Absolutely. Young people are more susceptible, obviously. But I would say in the current climate, everybody is vulnerable to radicalisation. And if anybody thinks otherwise, uh, you're living in a different land. If we can go back in history and look at El Gama, El Islamia, Many of those fighters that were in the terrorist group were in Egyptian jails and they managed to be successfully de-radicalised. Do you think that this is a model that could be used in the UK and abroad? Of course it's a model. This is something we've been trying to implement for many, many years. We had a model that was uh, providing interventions to extremists and potential terrorists within prison systems. Uh, our government decided not to do that because it was a bit too risky. Uh, the group and the individuals that were doing it were known as Salafis or you know, part of the problem uh, or had been involved in gang crime before. But they were the right ones to engage. Of course, it's a model that we should all follow. Um, but I'm afraid a lot of our governments, like I said before, have become so risk averse, they don't allow these models to, um, to develop or, or to be implemented within our society. Our, our country is an, is, an, is an ideal example for that. And I think many parts of Europe as well don't allow that to become uh, a policy because of the risk averseness within government. But that is the way forward. I know when I asked you earlier about the unified approach and you said that we're a long way away. Are there any countries that are doing it correctly? Are, are there any shining lights out there that we could emulate? There are a number of them uh, and, I, and I, it would be you know, wrong for me to sort of you know, say that everybody's the same. I think the our house model is, 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 is doing well. I think the Canadian model of at least giving return fighters uh, a chance, you know, um, giving them an opportunity to return. Um, what's going to happen after that? We, we don't know. What's their process going to be? What does their model look like? We're not sure, but at least it's a good start. Um, but our house model, there are other models. I mean, in Pakistan, there's a few models that have been implemented. Uh, in, in Saudi Arabia, people talk about that as a bit controversial, but I think it's an effective model. I think any model that's going to you know, provide an engaging platform or to provide interventions to uh, incriminated terrorists or those who are returning has to be the way forward. It, it, it can only be the way forward because you can't lock them up or you can't kill all the terrorists. You know, that's, a, that's, that's not the way forward. Mm -hmm. So and I think in terms of human rights, they've got a chance, they've got an opportunity, and they should be given that opportunity to change. What would you say to parents who are worried about their children, who think that they could be on the path to being radicalised? What can they do and who can they contact without any legal repercussions? I think the problem that we've experienced working at a grassroots level over the many years is that sometimes we find parents as part of the problem. Um, but in most cases, there are, you know... Uh, is that because of that conversation that we were talking about, yes. that ongoing conversation in the family? So historically, we found that um, immigrants from different parts of the world that are, that are living in this country or in Europe, um, they've never been sort of, they've never felt 
that they have a complete future in this country. And I'm not speaking for every single one. There's a lot of them that, that do. But whenever something happens like 9-11, for instance, you know, many people start to think that we've only got a limited time to, be, to, to, to live in this country because things have become so bad. Mm -hmm. And when they express those views and those feelings in front of their children, those children kind of eternalize that information and they process that in a very different way. So they become part, so the parents in that sense become part of the problem. But I would say that, you know, engaging with parents and having parents, you know, on the front line is very, very important because indeed those are, you know, uh, the parents are the main and the, and the first ones to respond and can, you know, resolve the issue before it becomes a nightmare. Now, but it's actually, you know, accessing those parents, getting them to understand at the moment, a lot of policy that's coming from European governments, our government here in particular, is actually alienating those parents. It's pushing them further away mm -hmm. against, uh, you know, between a, a rock and a hard place for engagement to continue. And I'll give you an example. We had an issue with, our government had an issue with the way we, would, we were engaging with a certain community. Um, but we had to engage with that community because that was seen as the problem community. So the Salafi community, for instance, yeah. they wanted to have an engagement between us and them. But they wanted us to facilitate separate halls for women and se so segregation. Yeah. And because we facilitated that so we can have the dialogue, our government found that an issue. So what I'm trying to say is that our policies and our, uh, the way we are trying to implement this are actually hindering our, our objective processes because we are not reaching out to the people that need to be reached out to or need to be engaged with. And by that, we are further alienating the problem. So it's a community-led issue that needs to be, I mean, you can't fix this problem by policing and, and sort of military alone. Mm -hmm. It has to be led by community. And if we are isolating that community or alienating them, we're not getting close to fixing the problem. We're actually creating a bigger problem for ourselves. Can I ask you about families that are not part of the problem? Recently we had Jihadi Jack, his parents tried to bring him back from the front, they sent over the money, and then they were threatened with prosecution. What can you tell me about that case? So it's, I mean, I, I worked on that case uh, quite closely. Um, and I have a lot of uh, information about that. I have a lot of understanding of, of that kind of issue. I mean, look, parents, as far as the parents are concerned, their children are not born radicals. They're not born extremists. They are, you know, it's like when we're working with members in the community or gangs, uh, and the parents will say, well, he's an angel at home, but outside he's a, he's a demon. Mm -hmm. um, and, and parents will never accept that their child or their son will be so violent or so uh, bad. Uh, and they will give every, you know, they will give their child every chance to redeem themselves or to protect them. Um, and that case in particular raises the, it raises the, the, the question, is that, you know, should the parent, you know, just walk away from their child? How can that happen? Mm -hmm. um, and it also emphasizes one point is that we should give uh, individuals like Jihadi Jack a chance to to change, but also the parents have the opportunity to uh, to see that you know everything has been done to try to change their son, because nobody is born a radical, um, and when they do become radical, what are we saying that they can't change? So parents have got a role, and sometimes parents do play a role, but it becomes very difficult for them sometimes to uh, when they see that their child is being radicalized because of what's been happening over the last few years with regards to security and policing, is that when a parent does reach out to the local authorities, the child's taken away and locked up for 15 or 16 years. So that's gonna hamper objectivity. It's gonna reduce the chances of people or parents coming forward to, to talk about their child or their daughter or son or their you know, brother or sister. So it leads to silence, doesn't it? It is, it does lead to silence. And it doesn't lead to positive action. It doesn't leave, lead to progression. So. Parents do have a role, but then it all depends on what role we want them to play. What can you tell me about the Twitter campaign, hashtag not in my name? Absolutely amazing. This is a, just an, it's an example of what campaigns can actually do. You know, going back to return fighters, we, we actually realized how effective the campaign was, not by the number crunching game. I mean, the BBC and the Americans told us that you've hit in excess of 300 million people, every single nation on the planet followed that campaign. But, I mean, that was reassuring and it was pleasing to us. But what was more pleasing and reassuring was that a young lady who, tr who returned from Syria uh, uh, with a child, um, and she's been incarcerated now, was asking to reach out to us. And when asked why, she said, well, because the campaign that they started, not in my name, actually had 
members from ISIS pulling their hair out? How can they try to hijack this campaign? How can they try to sort of hit back? And they couldn't. So for a period, that campaign actually rocked the prams of uh, ISIS for a while. So um, there are effective campaigns, but this also shows you that when you give young people a platform and an opportunity, campaigns like they're not in my name can be very, very effective and very powerful. And I'm looking forward to doing similar kind of campaigns in the future. IOHR have joined with you to launch the Not Born a Radical campaign. You yourself are a great success story. Are there any other success stories you can share with us? Absolutely. I think, well, first of all, it's an honour to be part of this Not Born a Radical campaign. It's something that um, we can prove to be very, very successful over the coming days and months. The success stories that I've worked with over the years, uh, there, are, there are a number of them, you know, and we can talk from individuals that uh, were plotting and planning a terrorist attack, individuals that actually carried out a terrorist attack, individuals that were preparing to go over, there's a number of them. They're all involved in mainstream work, they're, they're working, they look after their lives, some of them are married, some of them are in business, you know, some of them are out there in communities and societies, helping and engaging with other young men and women, preventing them from becoming radicals. And I think the Not Born a Radical campaign is something that I think will be very, very powerful. Um, just like the Not In My Name campaign, where it reached, you know, 300 million people, that was just a campaign that people just followed. The Not Born a Radical campaign will actually give young people um, the opportunity to express themselves, that nobody is born a radical. However, by investing in us and, and making us part of this campaign, we can actually prevent others from becoming a radical. Uh, you know, and it's, it's sending a, a positive signal. And I think, potentially, that this could be a very, very powerful and successful campaign. Hanif Kadir, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. And thank you for joining us today on IOHR TV. Don't forget you can keep up to date on our social media or on our website. Until next time, goodbye.